Morning, Tanya. Morning, Mariska. Good morning. Um, we're about Good three minutes morning. before the time, but um, I thought it's, it's a wise thing to start a bit earlier this morning because we normally want to talk way over the time. So, all right. Um, this morning is all about financial immigration or the way that we used to do it or call it financial immigration, but a lot of stuff has changed. So let's start with Maris. Oh, yeah, let's start with Tanya. Tanya, what's the main changes that you have seen in the new laws going forward? So, Jan, a lot has changed from the old financial immigration to tax migration. A lot is pertaining to, to SARS in terms of the application going forward. And I think Mariska is going to give us a little bit of detail in and around the process of what we do know at this stage. From the Reserve Bank, we're still waiting on communication as to the processes going forward. But we do have some feedback from SARS that we'd like to share with everybody. Okay. So basically, they've started a process, but they don't know how to do it. So we've got processes in place. We're just waiting on communication as to how we're going to be doing it going forward. Obviously, okay. we also have to communicate those processes with the various fund houses mm -hmm. to ensure that we're all aligned. I just don't think we're all set and ready to go yet. Um, but like I said, Mariska has some guidelines from SARS, which is going to enlighten us this evening. Okay. So what is, what's, the, what's the changes with regards to financial immigration? Okay. Tanya, you want to go? Um, so I think a little bit, it pertains more from the tax side. So what we, can, what we have seen is that you have to do a tax migration now. So you have to change your status at SARS from a South African to a non-resident. In terms of the processes as well, there's going to be no more MP336B documents. It's called a TCR01, if I'm correct, Mariska, the new correct. thing. Yes. And SARS will still require a detailed assets and liabilities going forward. And then we're just getting a bit of clarity um, as to how the accounts will operate. So we know that a blocked account is going to no longer exist. And those clients that still have blocked accounts don't need to worry. Um, they will still continue and they will obviously change to a status of a non-resident. But in terms of the details as to how we're going to do the process going forward, we haven't re yet received any communication. Where, where must this communication come from? So we're waiting on communication from the Reserve Bank. Um, so they are having a meeting in April. They have communi communicated the date to us. And then once we have clarity um, from there onwards, we will obviously make contact with the clients that reach out to us in terms of the process. But we thought it'd be a good idea just to give a little context around where we are situated at the moment and what we do know, um, I think, is important and that the word financial immigration no longer exists. So we, we, we're taking financial immigration, we're scrapping that and we're saying tax migration going forward. Correct. Okay. okay. I will get that around my head. So what's the differences? <laughs> Mariska, you want to take that one? Yes, yes. To get back to the word, um, in the words of Hugo Van Sale, he says, rest in peace, financial immigration. Um, and he never really liked the term anyway. It's actually formal immigration. Um, financial immigration has phased out the word and it was really a sob process. The end of the process was always tax migration. And that was when you gave up your tax residency with SARS. And that's the important part of it. Financial immigration was really placing your assets on record with SARS. Um, so SARP, sorry, but that that doesn't that falls away. SARP falls away in the process completely, and it's it's just SARS. So what you do just, now just is people at the SARP is South African Reserve Bank. Yes, correct. <laughs> okay. Um, so now you will apply for an immigration tax clearance certificate from SARS. So it's still a, a tax clearance certificate in respect of immigration. And that's what the TCR01 form is. Um, so you just complete everything on there. It will be a, a, um, all your worldwide assets where previously you were you only gave SARS your South African assets. And one of the requirements that you must also submit now with the application is a capital gains tax calculation. 
it was always part of the, the process, but it only came later on when you actually submitted your tax return, then you paid your exit tax, where now it becomes as part of the application form. And once that's approved, you then have an immigrant status with SARS as well. Uh, and then obviously there's a few things that happen afterwards, depending on what the client, what the taxpayer has, if they have other assets, if they have RAs. Um, it just depends each each case what will happen with them. Capital gains tax. Sorry, just to go back to that one. Um, if I've sold my house in three years, four years ago, will I now have to pay capital gains tax? No, because you would have had to pay capital gains tax on the property when you sold it three years ago. So that doesn't become a problem for you now. It's only the assets that you hold now and it's your worldwide assets. So anything that you have now. But if you live in New Zealand and you want to do your immigration and you have a property in South Africa, you don't necessarily have to, you don't pay capital gains tax on that property. You'll pay capital gains tax on that property in the future when you sell it. So it's your fixed assets of South Africa, uh, fixed property in South Africa, you don't pay capital gains tax on. But if you have investments or unit trusts, or maybe you have a property in New Zealand, that will become part of your capital gains tax that you pay in South Africa. So, so, will the, so they will tax me on my property in New Zealand? They will, yes. How can we not allow them to tax me on my property in New Zealand? Okay, so you should not buy your property then before you become a non-resident because okay. the Tax Act works this way that if you're a South African tax resident, then you pay uh, capital gains tax on your worldwide assets. So that will become part of your capital gains tax calculation. Okay. Um, that, that could become a sticky one for a lot of people myself included yes. <laughs> okay um we've got basically got, got a question here on our i'm going to remove the question because i've got very much the same question down here how can expats withdraw the retirement annuity after financial immigration has gone now okay so the the difference is that when you used to do financial immigration you could immediately withdraw your retirement annuity fund but that with financial immigration not existing anymore, you have to prove to SARS that you've been a non-resident for three consecutive tax years, then you are eligible to withdraw your retirement annuity fund from okay. South Africa. Uh, sorry, I, I want to go back to the capital gains tax thing. Um, <laughs> you only make, are allowed to pay capital gains tax if you sell your asset. Mm -hmm. So what happens on the date that you cease to be a resident of South Africa, it is deemed to be a sale of your property. So you don't have to sell your property. The, the selling price becomes the market value of your property on that day or the market value of your asset on that day. That's your selling price. So if, if, I, if I get a um, valuation that my property hasn't gained one cent, then I won't pay any tax. Yes, yeah, so it's obviously linked to the value. So you'll have the same thing that whatever the value is minus what you paid for it, that is your capital gain. Um, and there's a few more calculations to it. Okay. All right. We'll, we'll talk about the calculations afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Another question, how to become a non-resident taxpayer? Okay, so it's all to do with our tax treaty and our double tax agreements that we have with other countries. So if you live in a country where we don't have a tax treaty, then unfortunately you cannot become a non-resident. But in New Zealand, we do have a tax treaty and it is all to do with your time that you spend there. So if you are in New Zealand and you have a permanent home and uh, then you, you are a tax resident of New Zealand and you are considered to be an exclusive tax resident of New Zealand. If you don't have a permanent home, but you also spend 183 days there, you could also become a tax resident of New Zealand. So the tax treaty of New Zealand is actually quite simple and um, it's easy to do that. So it's just having a permanent home, spending 183 days there could allow you to become a non-resident. Of course, there's one very important uh, uh, scenario in this. And the first step in it is 
where are you ordinarily resident? And what that means is, where do you plan to be after you've lived in New Zealand, after you've traveled the world, wherever you are, do you plan to return to South Africa? And if that answer is yes, then you're a tax resident of South Africa living temporarily abroad. But if you have no intention of coming back to South Africa, plus you have your permanent home in New Zealand, you're an exclusive tax resident of New Zealand. And for that reason, you can then become a non-resident taxpayer in South Africa. Okay. So how, how does this tax treaty or the double tax agreement between South Africa and New Zealand work? So it's basically to do with your um, your permanent residence, uh, where you live, your permanent home. If you if you have your habitual abode in New Zealand, then you're a tax resident of New Zealand. Okay. So if if SARS comes to the point now and they say now I owe them let's say fifty thousand rand, but I say take it when I get, come back to South Africa when I never return to South Africa, how are they going to get their money? I don't know that. Um, so they will not um, allow you your immigration tax clearance certificate um, because the new process is that you have to declare your capital gains tax or your, your calculation with your immigration tax clearance certificate. So my thought is that they won't allow your tax, your tax clearance certificate if you don't um, do that. And your tax clearance certificate is always linked to you being compliant with SARS. Okay, okay, I fully understand that. Um, will I pay capital gains tax on ceasing to be a tax resident? Yes, so that's that's your exit tax. That's what you get to pay. Let's call it your penalty for ceasing to be a resident in South Africa. The reason behind it is that if you are a tax resident of South Africa, one day your estate will be taxed on all your assets and now you are giving up your tax residency in South Africa, which means that SARS loses out on the opportunity to one day tax your estate. And that is the reason why they then tax your capital gains tax now. Once you've paid that capital gains tax when ceasing to be a tax resident, you don't do it in the future again. It's not a South African asset then anymore. You've paid your dues and you don't do it in the future again. You'll pay tax on that in the country that you live if that country has one capital gains tax and also a state duty tax. Okay. Question from Leonie Winter asking, what if you're already in the process of financial immigration and SARS declined it? So this depends on that MP336 document that used to be part of the old process. If that was stamped by the bank before the 28th of Feb 2021, then that process still continues and uh, you have uh, until 28 Feb 2022 to conclude that process and it needs to be the immigration and also your retirement annuity fund needs to be withdrawn by the 28th of Feb 2022. So you have 12 months from the 1st of March when it um, was implemented. To do everything and get it all done. See? Yes. Other, other question comes that comes to my mind. Um, your, your assets, will that include anything that you've got in trust as well in New Zealand? So it is your worldwide asset. So it's anything that you own. Um, it, it obviously depends on your vesting rights, what, you, what, what the trust is set up, what rights you have. So it's your worldwide assets anywhere. So how, how will South African government know about stuff I've got in New Zealand? So it, you have to declare it, obviously, but we do have the common standard reporting, um, common reporting standard, um, with New Zealand and with 92 other countries where they do disclose information between each other. Obviously, they're not going to do it with each and every individual, but there it is um, a process that is followed by the governments. Okay. Let's see what other questions they was the uh, what is expect expect tax? Okay, so this is tax that uh, means that you're an expat, basically, and you earn foreign income. And in the past, this used to be tax exempt completely in South Africa if you spend 183 days out of the country. 
but then from the 1st of Feb 2019, so for, sorry, no, for 2020, so for the 2021, yeah, so for the 2021 tax year, it's became that only your first 1.25 million rand is exempt from tax um, in South Africa. And then the balance that you earn above that will be subject to tax in South Africa. And then if you live in a country where we do have a double tax agreement with, which is New Zealand, then the tax that you pay there is a tax credit in South Africa. So it just depends on, once again, we do a calculation to see how it's, um, uh, how, how basically your tax rate and our tax rate and then either you're going to pay nothing in South Africa or you might end up paying a little bit in South Africa. So I still need to um, need to declare my income in New Zealand even if to South Africa if I live here even if I if I live here for three years or five years. Yes, unless if you have in the past financially immigrated then you don't have to and if you've concluded your um, tax status with SARS but if you give up your tax residency in South Africa, then you don't have to declare your worldwide income anymore. It's literally just your South African source-based income. If you've done nothing, you just emigrated, you left the country and you live there, then you are you are supposed to tell SARS of your worldwide earnings. All right. This morning, we, we live on, a, on, a, on an Aussie channel as well. So um, does that mean the same for the Australian South Africans there? Yes, so we well, also have a double tax New Zealand, agreement. Is that right? Yes, we, we do also have a double tax agreement with them, and it's it's basically the same um, rules uh, that applies to that. And also, we have yeah. So if you earn there, you have the same double tax agreement with Australia. So you screwed wherever you you stay, actually. <laughs> <laughs> You're not screwed if you live in New Zealand or Australia because you can give up your tax residency. It's only when you're in a country where, where you have nothing, then you cannot, then you are subject to the tax on your foreign income that you earn. So that, as soon as possible, we need to give up our, our tax residency. I mean, that's something that I can't afford to lose. So, okay. Let me see what other <laughs> questions was there. Uh, what if I can't become a non-resident taxpayer? I think we've touched part of this already, but perhaps give us a bit more info on that. Yes. So you'll have the first 1.25 million rand per year tax-free because it doesn't matter where you go. As a South African working in a foreign country, you'll get that as a tax credit. But now if you earn, let's say, 2 million rand and you're in a country where there's no double tax agreement, no tax treaty, you cannot give up your tax status, then you will pay tax in South Africa on the 750,000 rand over the 1.25 million rand that you earn. So you'll then just in the end pay tax in the country where you don't live. So, so what, what about the... I know somewhere there was small print that said um, your domicile must be South Africa, that, and that meaning that you aren't living a set amount of days outside of South Africa. What if you never have gone back? So it, it's all to do with the tax treaty. It's um, it doesn't mean doesn't matter how long you've been out of South Africa. It's all to do with the country where you are, and it's what the governments did when they set up the tax treaties. They have uh, agreements with with the mutual countries. All right. On the other one, Leonie Winter is asking again: How much tax percentage for an annuity if you? But do you pay to SAS? So how, how big is the percentage of tax that you pay or lose of your annuity? Yes. So if you do it at maturity, which is at 55, then you get the first 500,000 rand tax free. But when you do it, when ceasing to be a tax resident, you lose that benefit of the 500,000 rand and you only get the first 25,000 rand as an exemption. And then your tax payable, it's on a sliding scale between 18 to 36 percent that you pay on, on the balance over 25,000 rand. Well, that. Well, well the, the age, let's say I, I wait until age 55 for my annuity to pay out, but I take it as a tax migration portion. Will the 500,000 still count there or not? No, because then you still do it as a tax migration. Okay. It only mm. counts if you do it on maturity. And the difference is when you do it on maturity that you can only get the first third as a lump sum and the balancing two thirds need to go into an annuity. 
And the problem is once once you've done that, you can never get that annuity out, pay it out again. I know I've tried. No, it's dark. Yes. You can, I've tried for a lot of floods. <laughs> you just can't. They won't allow you to move that money at all. So. Yeah, and there's a value, Mariska. If it's below 125,000 Rand, you can withdraw Correct. the full amount. Yeah. Correct. So okay. it's if it reaches that amount. Um, then you can, but most people still have it at a very high value. Um, so it's really just that last bit, which might even equate to one or two years worth of annuities. That's right. Yeah, that's hectic. That's hectic. Uh, what if I inherit funds from South Africa? What now? Um, yeah, so this topic is actually uh, very confusing at the moment because in the past, how you would do it is it's a Saab regulation, not a SARS regulation. So you would do a belated immigration with Saab and you can send your money out. But now that that has fallen away, the process of doing it is a normal, like a normal tax resident of South Africa and a non-resident of South Africa will be treated the same. So you're going to have to do a foreign investment tax clearance certificate if the value is above 1 million Rand to get that funds out of South Africa. Where this is a problem is that it could be somebody who left the country when they were five or 10 maybe, and they never had a tax number. They now have to register for a South African tax number to be able to do a tax clearance certificate to allow the authorized dealer to send that funds abroad. Can't, can't you just ask to be paid out in Bitcoin? <laughs> <laughs> I just my thought this morning, but let's just step back to this this question: If what if I inherit funds from South Africa? Um, being a tax resident and being a non-tax resident, how big is that difference? In inheritance, nothing. And as far as we understand it, from the first of March, twenty twenty-one, a non-resident and tax resident are treated completely the same. So it doesn't matter what amount you send out, if from the first round you treat it the same, like a South African resident um, and also now a non-resident, get the first one million rand that you can send out as your um, allowance per year. And then you can send up to 10 million rand on a foreign investment tax clearance certificate. It's exactly the same now for a resident or a non-resident. Okay. Let's say I'm, I'm in New Zealand, I wanna take a different scenario. I'm in New Zealand for five years or whatever amount of years now. I've never gone back to South Africa. I'm earning about in rand value about two million rand. How will South African uh, or SAS, how will SAS even know that I'm earning this amount of money? So it once again comes back to the, the common reporting standards. And I've actually seen a few of my clients who, where the bank would ask them, you need to confirm with the bank what other jurisdiction you are registered for tax in. So they could pick you up through your banking. And my recommendation for someone like this would be that just give up your tax residency with SARS. So you, you backdate it. So even if in that five years, if you lived in New Zealand and you've now purchased your property, you cease to be a tax resident on the date that you actually left the country and whatever your tax treaty says. So let's say you went to New Zealand after three months, four months, you had your permanent home, you become a tax resident of New Zealand. So backdate your tax residency to the date that you actually became a resident of New Zealand. And that takes care of the capital gains tax if you bought property after that. That takes care of your expat tax and it takes care of your stress so you can sleep at night. Okay, that 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 puts a lot of lights on for me now. So I love that thing that you can backdate something. So I can basically backdate it from to the day that I've left South Africa. Depending on your tax treaty, if your tax treaty says that, then yes. Um, mm -hmm. Most countries would say that you would have had to live there for 183 days. So then, once you meet that requirement, you would become a non-resident. Okay. Because most people in the first 183 days in a new country doesn't have or aren't allowed to buy houses and so forth. So that can actually um, can say, make it a bit easier for a lot of people. So yes. do you still need to declare your worldwide assets as the house and the boat and the car and the caravan and everything else if you are going to backdate it? No, because you backdated to that date. So it is the date that you cease to be a resident. What worldwide assets did you hold on that date? Okay. 
Okay. And for most people, that will be not a lot. Yes. Yeah, that's Correct. a good thing. <laughs> you gave us some hope this morning. So. <laughs> the state of despair of SARS coming over and stealing our stuff in New Zealand. Uh, you've given us some hope there. Um, I've run out of questions. I don't see a lot of other questions down here. If anybody's got any other questions, please pop them up on any of the screens. We will get them this side. What, what else can you girls tell me about this new laws and how, how will that affect in the long run your working down here? Look, I do think things have really changed from a Reserve Bank aspect. We are seeing SARS taking over a lot in terms of South Africans immigrating offshore. So SARS is requesting you to change your status, declare your assets, your worldwide income, which was never really a big focus prior. So we are seeing that now from, from SARS aside. As soon as we receive the communication from the Reserve Bank, we will obviously have another session, Jan, so that I can yeah, give please. feedback. But I think it's important that clients actually do know from the SARS aspect, and it's really important because myself and Mariska have been in the industry for many years, and over the years we've seen how things are getting a lot more stricter and how SARS is able to tap into offshore offices, tax offices now, and be able to obtain that information. So it's really important if clients have those type of questions that they reach out to us, Mariska can do those calculations for the clients, change the status, because it is going to be a requirement for anything in terms of facilitating those transfers for expats. Okay. And and with the guys um, that's got uh, blocked accounts that, that they can use in, in New Zealand through currency partners, once this uh, tax status change has gone through, will those accounts stay open or not? So the accounts, the blocked accounts will still remain open. There haven't been changes. What we do know in terms of the changes is the name. So it's going to be called a capital immigrant account. We're okay. not referred to as a blocked account. And that basically means non-resident. So everything will remain as is. In some instances, if funds are still transferred back to South Africa, those uh, accounts would need to be changed to a non-resident status. So they will be treated as a non-resident of South Africa and the same rules will apply to them. Same from the tax side. So if I want to, if I want to send some money to my mum out of that account, um, then I can still keep it open. Or if I want to receive some rental income from a house that I got in South Africa or whatever else, that account can still be used for that or not? So rental income is entirely different. So when you did your application to obtain your blocked account, we would have asked you for a rental agreement. So as long as that rental agreement was declared on your MP336B, you would still be able to receive your rental income. We might just change the status to a non-resident and then obviously attach those um, documents to the, to the account. Where it is where you're paying money, say, to a family member, if you have money already in the blocked account and you want to distribute locally in South Africa, you can do that. If you're wanting to send money from New Zealand to South Africa, I would send it directly into your mom's account. Okay. Just got a, just got a question on, on, um, on inheritance. Let's say I inherit a house and I don't want to sell it. And... Now, I've, I, don't, I don't have a rental agreement, but after the inheritance, I get somebody to rent from me. How do we incorporate that back into, the, into my assets that I didn't have before? I mean, I didn't lie about anything. This is something new. Yes, yeah, so you inherit the house. You don't pay tax on that because the estate will pay their tax on that. And on the date that you inherit the property it has a market value so you that becomes your base cost whenever you sell it in the future um, and then whenever you inherit anything whatever the growth on that inheritance is you'll pay tax on that growth so if you earn rental income you'll pay taxable uh, or tax on that rental income that you earn annually in South Africa and then when you sell the property in the future you'll pay capital gains tax on that property at the market value that you inherited it and then whatever you sell it for the difference will be your capital gain okay so somewhere along the line you are going to pay tax <laughs> you can and avoid it tax, like, so. yes unavoidable there's any other questions on the other side no no um, I have no more questions for you girls. Anything else you want to say? We've got three minutes left. 
I think maybe just to add, Mariska, um, maybe just a little clarity around it. Um, and this question always comes up to me is when I change my tax status, does it mean I'm deregistered of the SARS system? Mm. Okay. So it depends. If you have yeah. remaining South African assets or so remaining South African income, then you cannot cancel your tax number. So if you're still going to earn rental income or time to new to fund or whatever you have left, then you'll become a non resident for tax purposes, meaning that you don't have to declare your worldwide income to SARS ever, but you will your South African source base. If you've got nothing remaining, then you can apply at SARS to cancel your tax number. It's not an automatic process. Okay. Okay. All right. Easy solution there this morning, but <laughs> yeah, let's, let's have another you... session as soon as you go to know what the exact um, exact procedure there and. Okay, there's a last question from Leonie. Are you allowed to still have your bank account with an amount of money in SA when you financially immigrate? So if you're financially immigrated and you have money in your blocked account, yes, you can still keep it, yeah. Okay, but it has to be in your blocked account, not in your APSA, Foxcas, or one of those accounts. Well, with financial immigration, all other bank accounts need to be closed. So everything mm. must run through the blocked account. So you shouldn't have an F&B or app. So you actually, we request acknowledgement of the accounts that are being closed on your financial immigration. Okay. Uh, another question has popped up. If you have been out of the country for five years, no assets, annuity, bank accounts in South Africa, and you earn under 1 million, how difficult will it be to become a non-resident? This is from Lizelle Lombard. It depends on what country um, and what your situation is. So if she's in New Zealand, yes, then she will be able to apply for her non-resident tax status in South Africa. And because there's absolutely nothing in South Africa, she can then cancel her tax number and that will cut all her ties with SARS. Okay. I've, I've had a question. Sorry, we're nearly out of time. I had a question the other day. What happens if I go back to South Africa? What if, if New Zealand is not what I thought it would be and I need to go back to South Africa? What now? Now I've done the full financial immigration. I'm out of New South Africa technically. What happens if I need to go back? So there's two processes. I'll explain the SARS one and then Tanya, you can do SARB. Um, from, from SARS perspective, if you gave up your tax residency um, or you absolutely did nothing, you just come back and you can reinstate your tax number. And from a SARS perspective, you can just be a tax resident again. So that's from SARS, it's, it's a very easy process, yes. Okay. And then from the Reserve Bank side, if it's below the, the five year period, we do an application to the Reserve Bank and it's called a failed immigration. And at the same process, we would obviously get approval from the Reserve Bank and then change the status of your account from obviously non-resident to a resident. So you'd be able to transact in South Africa. So it's just an okay. application that we would do. So it is it is doable. So it's quite easy to start giving money to tax again, to SARS again. <laughs> All right. I was going to say, got to say thank you. I'm just going to pop you off the screen and then um, once we've done with our broadcast, I've got a question or two again to you girls. So thank you very much for being here this morning um and this is the ladies from mm -hmm. currency partners mariska also has got her own thing that she does mint accounting so i just want to bring that up because i sometimes get the question where does mint accounting come into this whole whole thing all right thank you very much for being here this morning mm -hmm. and with that good note we out thanks Jan. okay thank you Bye.